integrity file as if like I was sick or something or if we had uh, you know an emergency and and that was the only way you were getting the lecture but but it's there as as a tool you know and if it helps you uh, use it um, so this is Aristotle's virtue ethics and I'm going to stand up. Um, it's a compliment, I think, to ethics like utilitarianism and Kantianism that are focused on figuring out how do I decide what to do morally in this situation. Um, the Greeks from Socrates on were concerned more with what kind of person ought I to be? This is what Socrates said he was really teaching the youth of Athens, not to care for their, uh, you know, bodies or their, uh, or wealth or a prestigious position. Socrates said you can be wealthy and still not be a moral person, but he says, uh, Worry first, get your priorities straight. Worry first about what it means to be a good person, and the other stuff's going to follow. Socrates wasn't against wealth. He probably came from a wealthy family because we know he was a, a very heavily armored soldier in the Peloponnesian War, and the only way you got to be what was called a hoplite is to buy your own armor, so you had to, you know, plus he had a formal education. So uh, he's not against wealth, but he's saying get your priorities straight. So Aristotle, very much influenced by uh, Socrates and Plato in his own ethics, but he does depart from them uh, in what he thinks is the ultimate goal of ethics. Plato thought it was an abstract goal of learning goodness itself or the form of the good better. Um, for Aristotle it's uh, happiness in this life. So Aristotle's going to try to convince you that the happiest life for you is the virtuous life. Now that's not what a lot of things in the media are trying to convince you, right? The happiest life is, uh, you know, the life lived to excess in one way or another. Um, but the Greeks believe in following uh, what was called the golden mean, the uh, midway ground, and Aristotle really does a good job of uh, pointing that out. Now, we're going to see that Aristotle thinks that we're essentially rational animals, that since we were meant to exercise our thinking, our reasoning abilities, the happiest life for us is going to be one where we let our, our reason control ourselves and where we investigate things theoretically, where we learn more about our world. And he calls these the intellectual virtues. We're not going to spend uh, much time on them at all. Uh, but then there are also the moral virtues, which are focused around developing virtuous character traits. Um, and Aristotle doesn't believe that either you're born good or you're not. Now, re remember what the whole box said about that, right? The determinist, he said, you know, hey, everybody, no one has free will. Everybody's determined by nature. And uh, if you had bad things happen in your uh, genetics and environment uh, and you're determined to be a, you know, a criminal or something, um, the whole box says uh, we preach virtue in vain to such a person. You know, it doesn't matter how, uh, trying to convince them that there's a better life if they live a virtuous life uh, falls on deaf ears. But... Um, Aristotle has a much more positive view about that, and he thinks we can acquire virtuous character traits. We can develop them in us, uh, and sometimes we have the way we acquire them 
is by using our rational abilities to overcome things like our fears or other negative aspects of our nature. Uh, and so the way we become virtuous is tied up with using our reason to control our lives. Now, this is um, the reason you see the piano player or saw the piano player endlessly in that video, right? Aristotle says, uh, developing a virtuous character trait is really like um, learning any other skill. Uh, we learn to build by building. My dad, after World War II, he mar I was, I'm so literally a baby boomer, World War II baby boomer. It's not funny. My parents got married late in life in 1946, right after the war. And my brother and I came along about five years later. Let's do the math on that. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, um, my, my dad was doing house painting at the time, and it was really bothering his asthma. And my mother, who was very wise, said, look, why, why don't you go back and learn a different trade on the GI Bill? The government will pay for it. Do it. So he went back and learned to do carpentry, which he did, and supported our family for most of his life as a carpenter. Uh, of course, he couldn't get over the wanderlust, so he was a uh, carpenter in the Merchant Marine, a uh, ship's carpenter. But at any rate, um, I have in my um, living room a knick-knack shelf, which was one of the things he built when he was in carpentry school, right? You learn to build, you learn a trade like that by doing it, you know? And he says, the same with a musical instrument, and here's where we get the pianist. There weren't pianos around in Aristotle's day. The piano had not been invented. Uh, but there were instruments like lyres. Um, and so Aristotle says we learn to play the lyre by doing it, by playing the lyre. You know, I drove my brother nuts in high school because I was playing the same song over and over again, learning, trying to learn how to play the guitar and practice at it. Now, my brother was a very good rock drummer, but he didn't play the drums in the house while we were watching TV. But I did <laughs> with the guitar. At any rate, uh, so Aristotle says, look, developing a character trait, becoming a just person, um, is not something that happens in an instant, but we develop these character traits over time. And really for him it's a kind of circle. Um, you've got actions like making choices that require courage that produce the character trait like courage Or like temperance, I want to be more temperate in the area of food. You know what? I'm going to quit at one piece of pie, even though uh, I really want to have two or three. Uh, so you develop the character trait, whether it be something like courage or temperance, but it kind of comes full circle in that Aristotle says, well, once we become a temperate person or a more courageous person, then it becomes easier in the future to act consistently with that character trait, right? If I've developed temperance, then it becomes easier for me to make those food choices wisely in the future. If I've developed courage, easier for me to act courageously in the future. Um, so, for Aristotle, um, we don't develop these character traits by going off and meditating on courage or meditating on moral virtue or moral goodness. 
Plato had an abstract standard. He called it a form for moral goodness that was in another realm and, and part of being good is um, studying these abstract natures, whether it be for uh, virtues like justice or uh, temperance or, or, or for moral goodness. For Aristotle, the, Aristotle is much more practical. He says, you, you want to become more temperate, make, make those choices. You want to become more courageous, make those choices in your interactions with other people that call for, uh, for courage, whether it's courage uh, in confronting your boss or your supervisor or uh, whatever. I, I mean, um, so, so we don't become uh, just in isolation. We become uh, just uh, in our social interactions. And this is what Larry Thomas was trying to say in that video. And he looked and sounded just like that when I knew him. He did a, a visiting professorship for a year at the University of Virginia, so I got to know him a bit. And uh, nice guy and learned that he went to Baltimore City College. I went to Poly, but I didn't, never held that against him, and I don't think he ever held the fact that I went to Poly. Now, those of you who aren't from the area don't know that, but, but the City Poly or the Poly City rivalry is one of the earliest one of the most long-lasting high school rivalries in the country dates back to the 1880s. So, Okay, so we become moral then by performing just acts uh, in, in community. Now, this might be the most important slide in the whole presentation because it gives... Aristotle's view of what a virtue is. Basically, um, here you see the Greek ideal of pursuing the golden mean. For Aristotle, a virtue is the midway point between two vices. One, a vice of deprivation, and the other, a vice of excess. And so, uh, the virtuous course for our lives is the moderate course. Um, and he gives several examples. Both Plato and Aristotle were concerned with temperance. Anybody ever hear like in history of the WCTU? Well, it's a long time ago, way before my time. It stands for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And that was the women's lobbying group that helped to get prohibition passed in the early 1920s. Um, you know, so temperance we find in, in some religious ethics too as a character trait. Um, for Plato and Aristotle, you achieve temperance by uh, letting your reasoning abilities uh, take charge of the desires of your lower nature. Temperance for Plato and for Aristotle uh, is more, mostly connected with uh, what they call our lower natures, the part of our nature that has to do with what's uh, from our stomach on down, uh, the desires we have for um, food and drink and sexual fulfillment. Um, and so he's, he says... Look, the virtuous course of action is the midway ground the, between deprivation. In, in other words, you don't want to deprive yourself of the basic needs of your body. You don't want to be like um, Eastern mystics and, and think you can live on just air alone, you know, and meditate. No, you want to, uh, you know, take care of the needs of your physical needs, but don't go overboard. Don't be a drunkard, don't be a glutton. Uh, and so the way, you know, the virtue then is the midway course, the moderate course between those. Likewise, courage. Um, when I was in college, it wasn't 
all that long after World War II, some of my professors had gone through, had fought in the Second World War. And I remember my Greek professor, he liked to give us little anecdotes from his war days. And he said, apparently he was may, maybe a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant or something, leading a platoon of men. And he said they had this young 18-year-old that just got into the unit, right? And so they get into a firefight with the Germans. That's a nice way of the newspapers like to talk about uh, two people, uh, you know, trying to kill one another with rifles and things. Uh, sound, the firefight sounds better than other words you could use. And so this young, you know, kid starts standing up like he sees them do in the movies. Of course, nobody ever gets shot in the movies. And he gets shot, you know, because he's sh shooting out of, you know. Well, well, I mean, you might say, well, that's not necessarily courageous. That's just stupid. That's foolhardy. You know, so for I think he, he kind of illustrates one part of non-virtuous action. You know, courage is not feeling no fear and just having total bravado. In, in backgammon, uh, one of the things that a new player has to learn is when to take chances and when not to take chances. Um, you know, and, and some players go from one extreme to another. You know, they... Uh, are timid and uh, want to move ultra safe and they can't develop very well doing that. You take calculated risks to develop your game. And so then they start to take too many chances and expose themselves too much. You can get hit and sent back to the beginning. It's like Parcheesi if you ever played Parcheesi, well, except much more complicated. One of the world's great games, right? Along with things like chess. So the point is, um, for Aristotle, it's not being foolhardy, not, not having no fear, but it's also not being overcome with fear so that you, you know, are, are bound up with it and not capable of acting courageously. But it's feeling fear but overcoming and dealing with your fear. Um, and you find, you know, like those baseball players down there at Camden Yards, you know, multi-million dollar baseball players, I'll bet you, right, there's a, now it's 100% chance of rain, so maybe it'll be rained out tonight, but I'll bet you a number of them have butterflies in their stomach right now. This is what you've worked all year for. Here's a playoff game for the... American League Championship, you know, you often find famous athletes saying, yeah, I get kind of jittery and, and knots in my stomach before the game, you know. Same thing with, with uh, world-famous performers. They, they get some stage fright before they're, uh, you know, ready to go on stage, but they deal with it. They keep it in control. And this is what Aristotle is saying, you know. It's, it's knowing when to manage your fear and make courageous decisions, you know. Often in backgammon, you know, there could be situations where the right play is to take a calculated risk, but if it goes bad, it could really go bad. But you have to have the courage to just, you know, do it and, and see what happens. Um, so the virtuous way to act then is to uh, act in the moderate way, to achieve the mean. And how do we do this? Well, we use our uh, rational nature, the rational part of us, to keep things in check, in control. Um, and often we have to act against nature, right? Nature may say, hey, man, what, you're, 
you're going to have one piece of apple pie and the whole pie sitting there on the table in the next room. Go in there and help yourself. Your lower nature say, you say, no, I, I want to develop some self-control here. I'll stop at one, right? Or, or, or uh, you know, you're fearful. You don't want to make the courageous decision, but your reason says, no, but that's the thing to do. You know, and back at me and say, look, I know from having studied the game that the right thing to do here is to expose myself to possibly getting hit and losing the game and the match right there on one roll, but it's the right thing to do. And the odds are with me, but do you have the courage to do the right thing? You know, sorry for the game illustration, but um, so how is this? Here's where we get into this word arete. What, what, what Aristotle's talking about as virtue is, is more than just being a goody two-shoes. It's more than just goodness. Um, it, it's basically living what for a human being is an excellent life. Um, how do we do this? Well, the same word used for virtue uh, in terms of moral virtue in Aristotle, is the same Greek word, the Greek word arete, that's used for the excellence of anything in performing its function. For Aristotle, the essential nature of a thing, an inanimate object, is bound up with what it's meant to do, right? The essential nature of a piece of chalk is... Uh, bound up with its function. Its main function is to be able to write on chalkboards, right? It's not going to do a good job of writing on that paper, but it will write on the chalkboard. You know, the essential nature of a pen, on the other hand, is to write on things like paper. And the essential nature of something like glasses, obviously, is to help you see better. So the Arete, the excellent, if I say, you know, hey, this is just a cheap pair of reading glasses, but they're good reading glasses. You know, well, what do I mean by that? That they, they performs its function well. Um, and likewise, uh, Aristotle uses the example of a knife. Its essential nature, its function, what separates out a knife from a pair of glasses is a pair of glasses isn't made to cut a chicken bone with. But um, a knife is, right? But, and so if the essential function of a knife is to cut things, a good knife, arete, is a knife that cuts well. Now, if, if, if you and I were fixing dinner in uh, yours or my kitchen, and I said, look, you know, um, i got to cut through this chicken bone. Uh, don't give me that knife. Get, give me that chef's knife so, over there. It's a really good. Uh, well, if I said, you know, that's a really virtuous knife over there, that chef's knife. You say, what do you mean? A virtuous knife? Well, we don't talk that way. But... In, in Greek, the same word used for an excellent knife, a knife that cuts well, that performs its function well, is also the, the word Aristotle uses here for virtue. But we do talk about moral goodness, and we talk about a good knife as a knife that performs a function well. Right? I can say, look, look th th don't hand me that knife over there. That's dull. You know, that's not no good. Uh, hand me that one. That's a really good knife. It performs its function well. And so an excellent life, a virtuous way, life for Aristotle, is bound up with our performing our function, what we're meant to do as human beings well. And for him, I mean, the essential nature of a thing is, is what is unique to that thing, Right? What's unique to a knife is that it's something that cuts. What's unique to this is it helps you see better, read better, right? And this helps you figure out midterm grades better, right? 
Um, which are due next week and, and will be based on test one. Have to get them in. Take them with a grain of salt, right? It's not midterm. It's based on about 25% of the total work for the semester. There's plenty of room to move up, you know. At any rate, to get back to this, if Aristotle, if, if, if acting virtuously, living an excellent life is bound up with fulfilling our chief function as human beings, well, well, how do we figure out what that is? Well, here Aristotle says, what's unique to human beings? Well, it can't be just having biological functions because even plants have biological functions. It can't be having an emotional life or sentience because that we share not with plants but with non-human animals. Um, but for Aristotle, what makes us unique as human beings and where he thinks he can draw a sharp line between us and non-human animals is that our reasoning abilities. So he says that's what's unique to us. We're reasoning animals. So in other words, for Aristotle, we can draw a sharp line between human beings and non-human animals at the point of reason. And, um, you know, so can't be biological functions, those we share with plants and animals, can't be sentience or an emotional life because that, having feelings that we share with non-human animals, but he says it's uniquely rationality. And, and the point is, um, for Aristotle, that is what enables us, that's our essential function, to be reasoning beings. Now, after Darwin, um, the difference between human reason and the reason of non-human animals has been portrayed as a difference not in kind, for Aristotle, human reason is different in kind from that of any non-human animal. Post-Darwin, the thought is that human reason, yeah, it's better, but the difference is a difference in degree, not in kind, uh, between us and um, the higher primates or dolphins or border collies. Right? You ever seen those stickers that say, my border collie is smarter than your honor student. They're supposed to be one of the smartest dogs, although the only border collie I ever knew wasn't very smart. <laughs> um, and so this is what Aristotle thinks. Now, why be moral? Uh, we, we don't have a, a lot of time, but I only have a few slides anyway. So happiness, he says, is an activity of, of, you know, making these temperate choices. And he says it's activity in accordance with virtue. For Aristotle, the virtuous life is also the happiest life. The, the word there is eudaimonia or eudaimonia. It's more or less a feeling of well-being, total well-being. It's not just, oh, I'm happy today, you know, but, 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 but kind of a, a, a deep satisfaction with the way life is going. And, and the point is, he says happiness is an activity in accordance with virtue. And happiness is desirable for its own sake and morality. Here's a quick uh, illustration from one of my past ethics textbooks. You'd say, well, it's good to eat... I mean, there are things that are instrumentally good. Good only because they promote some other good end. Well, they can't be the ultimate end of something. They're not good in themselves. You can say it's good to eat healthy foods. Why? Well, you'll be healthier yourself if you eat uh, healthy foods. Why be healthy? Well, people who are healthy, not only do they live longer, but they're happier. They lead, you know, happy, more satisfying lives. But then if you go on to ask, well, why be happy? 
Why should I value happiness? For Aristotle, the buck stops there. Happiness is not some end to be sought because it promotes some other good, but happiness is the end point, the end to be sought for its own sake. You know, so he says this is the end of ethics, uh, a happier life. So for, for Aristotle, um, the old cliche, virtue is its own reward, uh, is true. Why be moral? Because it's the happiest life. So, he discuss, so it, acting in accordance with virtue is the happiest life, and that turns out to be a life of moderation since uh, the virtues are achieved when we achieve the mean, the moderate lean. So for him, the happiest life is the moderate life. Not what's sold in the media. Usually the happiest life is a life where you're going overboard in some direction, you know. Um, but as I said, as an old guy now, you know, so over the years, some of the happiest people I know are the people who live a basically well-balanced life, you know. So um, anyway, for him, happiness. Now, whether you buy Aristotle or not, I mean, uh, it is a theory that a lot of contemporary ethicists think is important. There is something important in ethics to talk about what kind of person we should be and what makes, uh, you know, for good character as well as uh, talking about whether we should or should not do this or that and how we figure that out, what's the moral thing to do. Later we will look at utilitarianism and Kantian ethics that uh, are bound up with figuring out what's the right thing to do morally. Uh, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, I, I call the roll, but, but um, uh, you, you can come up and let me know. And I graded those scantrons. I, I didn't call. Oh, I meant to do that. Well, hold it. Let me, let me it, it's only going to take a minute. Well, um,